Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so yeah, I am an assistant professor in computer science mechanical engineering, and I run the Accessible Creative Technologies Lab. Um, today I'm going to talk to you mostly about my thesis work, but also some of the directions I'm going um, in the last year and hoping to move forward into around optimizing medical making, support for digital fabrication in healthcare. So I got into the digital fabrication space thinking about tools like 3D printers and laser cutters and eventually machine knitting um, because it promises us that anyone can design and make just about anything. And HCI has had a long history with design tools that support digital fabrication, um, thinking about all of the different ways we can use computers to design different physical objects in the world. But at the end of the day, we've still mostly been focused on a small subset of users, people who have some kind of engineering expertise and come from backgrounds that can leverage those specific interaction techniques. So perhaps it's more accurate to say that digital fabrication promises us that engineers can design and make just about anything. I like to think about these digital fabrication design tools along two different dimensions. One is the complexity of the tools, both how difficult or they can be to use, but also the complexity of what they can produce and the fabrication domains. And a lot of research on digital fabrication has thought about expanding these different fabrication domains by increasing the complexity of these tools so that they can be used by experts. Alternatively, we have tools designed for novices that kind of lower the floor for folks who are trying to approach different techniques like creating tactile graphics or personalized casts. And a lot of these works will frame these as uh, novice engineers or novice makers. But I like to think about them a little bit differently and add this third dimension here of domain expertise. So novice users are folks who have no relevant expertise to the problems they're trying to solve. They're an important group of people. We also have orthogonal experts. Orthogonal experts are domain experts without experience in using these complex tools, but also have domain knowledge that they use to solve those fabrication challenges. And by reframing them as orthogonal experts, we can start to think about building design tools that help align domain expertise with the complexity of those design tools, allowing us to lower the floor for creating things like tactile graphics and machine knitted samples, and raise the ceiling for people who want to do new things with 3D printing, creating medical devices, or machine knitting. To align orthogonal expertise, we first need to understand orthogonal fabrication practices and look at the communities that are already using fabrication tools in these different domains and how they bring their expertise to bear. And so in that regard, I've done a lot of work on exploratory studies of what I call medical making. Medical making is the application of digital fabrication to create medical devices and support the point of care. So thinking about 3D printing things in healthcare settings like hospitals or creating assistive technologies directly with disabled users. And I've done a lot of different kind of sampling of different communities who are doing this, creating things like 3D printed grips in special education environments, working on creating 3D printed prosthetic devices um, that can be used and designed by the end user working with clinicians, particularly at the VA, to solve critical challenge in healthcare infrastructure, as well as groups in GLIA, uh, called GLIA in Gaza who are using this in crisis situations or emergency medicine. And as we were doing all of this different work studying these different communities of medical makers and the ways they were using 3D printing to solve problems, there was a growing community that eventually went online with the creation of the NIH 3D Print Exchange. If you're familiar with online 3D printing repositories like Thingiverse, where you can share your 3D printable models, this is kind of like Thingiverse, but for doctors and biomedical scientists. All of the designs that are up on here are intended for clinical communities. And around the end of 2019, I think I had kind of settled that I had studied all of the different communities I could find who were doing this. These were relatively rare practices back then. Um, and I thought, OK, we've gotten a good sample of what folks are doing. Let's go build some tools. And, uh, well, 2020 came, and suddenly this was no longer a rare practice. This was something that hundreds of thousands of people were doing overnight, um, building 3D printed technologies for fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. So we had a lot more to explore going forward. But this really kind of transitioned to my work to being more engaged in supporting these communities because we were trying to fight the pandemic um, at the moment. I first got involved with a community I worked most closely with named Make for COVID because I was quarantining with my mother in Denver. Uh, and I saw on the local broadcast station a picture of my high school engineering teacher's daughter 3D printing face shields for a local hospital. So I gave him a phone call, 
uh, said, hey, I, I kind of do this now. I do a lot of 3D printing in healthcare. Can I help? What can I do? Um, and he brought me into this community. Um, I thought I would just do a couple of 3D printing samples and then be done with it. But they needed a lot more support. Make for COVID was incredibly successful. There were a number of communities like them. Uh, they ended up producing more than 100,000 pieces of PPE and delivering them across the state of Colorado and the greater Rocky Mountain region. Uh, we were incredibly successful, and I know that clinicians are still actually using these 3D printed face shields in Denver today. The role that they brought me in on was quality control. They needed to know that the things that they were making in makers' garages would actually be safe in clinical settings. And while we were able to produce so many safe and reviewed devices, there were a lot of junk that also came in through our, uh, through our group. Because there's a lot of challenges in 3D printing something that really meets the robust needs of clinicians. Common little mistakes in your 3D printer could cause something to bend or break in a way that would be really dangerous if you were using it in a clinical environment. The NIH also noticed this problem across makers, that people were having trouble identifying what designs were safe and useful. And so they converted their NIH 3D print exchange into something kind of like a FDA light. They were starting to review the designs that people were sharing to evaluate if they were going to be safe for clinical use, which means they're uh, determined to be safe and also effective at preventing COVID-19. Safe for community use, which means they're just safe to wear, but we don't really know if they're effective. Um, and then they also marked some designs as unsafe or something that you would not want to use um, under any circumstances because they could do harm to the user. I worked with the NIH during this time to come up with a review process, and then we were later able to evaluate the results of that review process after the acute phase of the pandemic. One of the key things that we found by studying all of these designs that people were sharing and the results of those reviews was that teams that included clinicians in the design process produced better devices. They got more clinical review ratings. They got more community review ratings. Um, some of the first designs that met these reviews were part of the University of Washington team, which included clinicians from the medical school as well as engineers uh, from the engineering college. And then when we looked at the, pop, uh, the designs that were significantly more likely to be verified as safe, they included clinicians as well. Unfortunately, most designs did not have a clinician on the design team, and so they lacked that expertise. And those designs tended to be marked as unsafe or not reviewed at all. Now, I've done a lot of the work in these exploratory studies, and I could come up with all sorts of recommendations for how to approach these medical making specific places. But what I'm really interested in is thinking about how this teaches us how to build better design tools for these populations. How do we align that clinical expertise with design practices? And I think two key themes kind of come out of this. The first one is to amplify the success of the design teams that include these experts, so just those teams that have clinicians on them. And the second one is to generate specialized designs using domain knowledge rather than requiring people to kind of go through the engineering or 3D modeling process. So let's look at some tools that we've built that apply this kind of first idea of amplifying expertise. Let's say that we're trying to amplify the expertise of folks who are creating these 3D printed face shields. We had these first initial set of designs um, that have different key features designed by clinicians. One could include a splatter visor, which protects you from droplets from above, particularly useful in surgical settings. Um, we could look at designs that come from Prusa and other engineering companies that are designed to be really durable and comfortable. These are the designs that are still being used in the hospitals around the country. And then things that are meant more for community use. Quick print, something you could print on any cheap 3D printer that you have lying around. We saw something kind of strange when we were looking at the design of face shields and other pieces of PPE during this time, which was that they converged really quickly. Makers generally are a creative bunch. They're trying to innovate. They come up with really wild things. They don't tend to do the same thing as other folks. Um, but in this context, they converged on a, basically a small set of designs within two months and then made small changes after that. So they would make some common modifications to fit them in a certain environment, switching out materials to whatever filament was available to them, adjusting the sizes to fit different people's bodies, or adding a component they liked from one person's design, like the splatter visor, onto another person's design. And in general, when we study remixing behaviors in maker communities, we see that they are making small changes based on changing design requirements or fitting them to the context of the point of care that they're working in. Unfortunately, making those small modifications is still really hard, um, and we need better design tools to do this. So one approach that we can take to amplifying the, the expertise of these users and supporting remodeling is to think about how we do this in a programming situation, or how we uh, essentially share and reuse code more effectively. And for this, we can go back to some pretty old literature on end user programming. 
and think about the complexity or the skill used to, required to use a tool compared to the flexibility that that tool provides you. So at the top end of the spectrum are programming languages that have a ton of flexibility and are also really complicated, and programmers can build all sorts of different things. They can share those tools that they build with what uh, McLean called tinkers. Those are essentially design tools where they can change parameters. They've got some flexibility and some amount of skill, but they're able to kind of customize designs. And then they can share the end results with a wider population um, who has no flexibility but can still make use of them. One of the first places we started to play with this idea of programming languages as a uh, alternative for reusing designs was looking at the space of machine knitting. This worked out really well because the state of the art right now for machine knitting tools is just kind of programming languages. Um, this weird like MS Paint pixel art thing is actually a programming language. Uh, that's a piece of code. Each of those dots represents a machine instruction. Uh, you can imagine programming a knitting machine to be very frustrating in this tool because it produces this complex glove. So if you want to do anything like resize that glove or change out that, uh, that texture, you're kind of at a loss. On the other side of the spectrum, hand knitters are also doing programming when they're sharing their designs. Uh, they write out their instructions in this very formulaic language that gives instructions for someone to follow the pattern. And this is kind of how they do the iteration on their designs. A lot of them don't realize this, but this is just programming. Um, it's just the human is the compiler. And so we looked at this as an opportunity to take this like large corpus of designs online that are already built as programming languages and amplify them by creating a toolkit so that you could manipulate them in a computer and then put them out into a knitting machine or back into hand knitting notation. We found samples from a book called The Essential Stitch Collection and a website called Stitch Maps that had the same uh, structure to their language. And so you can take this knit speak, this hand knitter programming language, input it into a model called a knit graph, which you can edit in different various tools, and then you can output that on the machine. And this opens the door to all sorts of knitting specific design tools, gives us a platform to play around with these different components. Of course, this hand knitting language wasn't designed by programmers to support building design tools. Um, and so there's some major limitations in what we can produce with it. And so I've started to take this from the other direction, saying that the experts here are knitting experts. They have the design tools. Um, and the orthogonal experts are programmers who have some kind of domain expertise in programming languages that allows us to build new designs. And so we have some new work on this. If you guys are interested in knitting machines at all, I've recently released this online open source so people can play around with this language. Um, and I've also incorporated it into classes that I taught at the University of Washington and teach at Northeastern, where we're using machines to produce all sorts of interesting devices and fun objects. But let's take this a little bit further. Let's move away from programming languages, probably not the right user interface for most contexts, but start to dig into what are the techniques that programming languages offer us that support amplifying expertise. We can encapsulate code based off of its purpose, making things modular. We can separate our concerns, and this allows us to support testing on specific units of code. And we can relate properties of methods to the ways of modifying them so that we can kind of build and iterate on code in a very defined way. And if we want to include this in the fabrication space, we need to start thinking about how that interacts with geometry and physical objects. To do this, we introduce the concept of functional geometry, um, which relates geometric components to simple programs for testing and modifying them. So functional geometry, like code, encapsulates geometry by its real world purpose, associates geometry with automatic tests, and relates geometry to ways of modifying it. So for example, we can create uh, 3D models that are assertions, automatic visual verification of our design requirements. In this example, let's say we're making a cup holder that mounts onto your bike handlebar. One assertion you might put in there is that the handlebar and the cup can't be in the same spot. And so we can highlight that in red when the two pieces of geometry are interfering with each other and manipulate the 3D model until we find a solution. <clears throat> or we can create integrators, which modify geometry based on specific design requirements. In this case, the cup holder is kind of floating off in the air, and the integrator, that blue vine-like structure, uh, grows between the two of them so that we can connect them and create one solid piece of geometry. And we can amplify the expertise or the patterns of people who are already building 3D models in these communities by looking at how they can interact with integrators and assertions. So for this work, we looked at Thingiverse, and we took a variety of different design patterns, and we built out those design patterns in this uh, toolkit. And this allows us to kind of recreate existing models in a way that is more reusable or easier to modify. So my favorite design that came up in that initial study was this kind of disco ball CD lamp found or upcycled art type thing. Uh, 
Um, but the 3D model was really confusing. I couldn't figure out how it was supposed to go together. Um, I know I'm not the only one, because to this day, the only comment left here is, oh, come on, tell us how you put this together. Um, so I was able to build one entirely from scratch on my own, representing all of the different real world components as assertions so that we didn't have any geometry interference, as well as the 3D printed parts. Um, and a key feature I want to highlight here is that red sphere at the center of the lamp. That doesn't just represent the light bulb. It represents the heat coming off the light bulb, because when I first made this model, I used an incandescent light bulb, and it actually started to deform the plastic. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that all the 3D printed components were far enough away that they wouldn't deform over time. And so I'm able to kind of embed that assertion into it. So if someone else picked up this model, they would know, oh, I don't want there to be any like heat coming off there. I can't put anything in there. And so we can kind of share the expertise of the person who went through the design process going forward. We can use these to build things like face shields and in integrate other features, such as an assertion to prevent uh, make sure we have enough space between our forehead and the shield that causes airflow and prevents it from fogging up. We can use integrators to adjust the fit or set the set of parameters together so we can adjust people's heads, as well as a compliance integrator, which will allow us to adapt to different elastic materials. If you've got a piece of like rubber band holding something together, it's going to stretch a lot more, and so you need the plastic to kind of pull out, versus if you have something that's more of a stretchy fabric material, you wanted to pull in a little bit more. And adjusting those can be really difficult to communicate to someone who's just picking up the 3D model and adjusting the parameters. That next approach to aligning clinical expertise is to think about uh, essentially generative design or allowing people to kind of use their domain expertise to directly generate a model. And we get some of the insights from this from my work with occupational therapists. Um, so occupational therapists, in this case, are the orthogonal experts. And they already use standardized parameterized designs to build hand splints, so splints that would kind of restrict your thumb motion after an injury or if you had carpal tunnel. Um, and then they just kind of go through this manual process of tuning those parameters to fit a particular person. This usually takes many in-person appointments. It causes these splints to be very expensive um, and unreliable. But these makers already know how to do um, all of these kind of adjustments. They have a set of objectives in their head. They want things, they want to support thumb flexibility or restrict it, wrist flexibility, breathability. This makes sure it's comfortable, something you're going to wear all day, and then fit to a particular user. And they also know how those associate with specific parameters in their models. So thumb flexibility is set up by parameters that adjust the size along this dimension, while wrist flexibility adjusts this direction. Breathability is determined by the cooling holes or the amount of holes that you place into the material. And then fit to the user is a set of dimensions that are also represented when you form this around the person's hand. We can convert this into a generative design approach using an optimization process where we input some user-defined set of goals in a domain, such as those objectives from uh, creating a splint, into some black box optimization process that the orthogonal expert doesn't need to know about, and automatically generate a solution. And when we looked at a variety of different optimization or generative design toolkits in the fabrication space, we saw a similar pattern in how all of these optimizers work. You start by inputting some initial set of designs, maybe pulling them from an online repository, and then you evaluate those designs with an objective function. You then use the information from that objective function to choose a particular design to examine further, and you consider whether or not you want to accept that design and return it to the user. If you don't, you modify the design, hopefully making it a little bit better, and then evaluate that design starting the process over again. And we can iterate like this for a very long time until eventually we found a design that meets our acceptance criteria, ideally some local maxima or something that passes a threshold score, and then return it to the user. Built around this cycle, we created an optimism toolkit, which supports, breaks this into two different components from a domain agnostic library, which we provide with the toolkit, and a domain-specific library, which is built by a programmer and a domain expert. From that domain-specific library, we can customize objective functions. And then from a domain agnostic library, we can choose strategies for selecting designs based off of those scores. We can also consider whether or not to accept the design using domain agnostic stopping criteria. And then finally, we break the modification step into just two sub-steps, selecting a modification and applying the modification. Selecting the modification is a domain agnostic approach, while applying the modification is a domain specific approach. So how do we build these domain specific libraries? How do we adjust them in such a way or help the programmer and the domain expert collaborate to build these different components? 
Well, we base it around the concept of a heuristic or a kind of rule of thumb for improving a design. And then we consider the two subcomponents of that, the objectives or the goals that, that are relevant to that design and the modifiers or ways of changing those designs. So an objective isn't a function that takes in a design and returns a score between zero and one, one being good for that objective. And a modifier takes in a design and returns a new, slightly different design. And we can plug them into this component here and then go through the uh, optimization process. Now, we can't just have objectives and modifiers willy-nilly. The domain expert needs to tell us what objectives go with which modifiers. And so first, they weight a set of objectives, and this creates an objective function. And then they provide a set of modifiers and heuristic weights between those objectives and modifiers. Here, a high weight between an objective and modifier implies that the domain expert thinks that modifier will tend to improve that objective. And then we apply them over and over again. Let's go through some examples in different domains we've built optimizers for. Going back to the machine knitting space, we want to build a heuristic map that allows us to control the physical properties of these uh, fabrics. And we do this by looking at the structure of a specific knitted component. Or we take a loop of yarn, which is innately unstable. If you pull on two ends, it becomes a strand of yarn. But we pull another loop of yarn through it, and now it's a stabilized piece of yarn. And then we build a fabric out of that component. And if we look at the direction that we pull those loops through one another, we see that they tend to curl in a predictable way. Um, and we can accumulate this curl across an entire pattern to figure out how much the fabric overall will curl. And we can accumulate that across rows of, of loops to take that average and figure out if the fabric will curl in on itself. And if we invert the curl, we can create kind of stretch and all sorts of other physical properties. So we can measure that as an objective. We can also create modifiers with this by changing out the direction of different stitches to control those different properties. And if we do all of those kind of flip stitches or mixing different stitch patterns together, we can create a heuristic map that will allow us to create specific objects with controlled properties, like this lacy lampshade here. Another example of heuristic maps that we've been doing recently is working with ophthalmologists to design optimizers to help them select cataract lenses for cataract surgery. Um, they were able to really easily come up with a set of heuristics for us to think about the different objectives they have, such as preventing farsightedness, um, accommodating for their own surgical error, matching their preferred prescription of the patient, and preventing uh, nearsightedness. And then we also looked at the three characteristics that they already consider when they're adjusting or choosing between different lenses, which is what they call the A, content, uh, um, a constant, as well as switching out the different lens model or the brand, essentially, of these different devices. And then finally, we have examples of heuristic maps um, in, for creating tactile graphics uh, for people who are blind or low vision. And a key insight here is that orthogonal experts are sometimes people with disabilities, not necessarily just clinicians, um, because people with disabilities have a deep understanding of their own set of needs and how those needs can be accommodated. So in the context of creating tactile graphics or tap -tap tactile maps, they can come up with a set of objectives, which are essentially the preferences for what types of information are most important to them. And they can also create modifiers that show their preferences for how information is displayed that fit their particular set of uh, sensory capabilities, depending on how blind or low vision they are, as well as what other types of techniques they use for navigating tactile objects. Now, you can imagine setting up these heuristic maps uh, in a piece of code might be a little bit overbearing for people with disabilities or clinicians who don't like looking at code. And so we automatically generate an interface for them to kind of iterate and modify these different heuristic maps, as well as an automatic tuning method where they can just input a bunch of designs with objectives and modifiers applied to them, and then it will generate a set of heuristic weights. And the key insight we get from both of these techniques is that when domain experts are the one who are designing the heuristic maps without the assistance of a programmer, we get better results. So if we look at designs created with the automatically generated weights or weights uh, specified by the domain expert, we converge on higher scoring designs or better designs compared to designs where we use a uniform weight, where we're essentially not giving the optimizer any information about the relationship between objectives and modifiers. I think the heuristic map is kind of the key concept here about how we amplify the expertise of domain experts, um, but we still got to build that domain agnostic library into the system. Because if we just kept kind of applying the same set of heuristics over and over again in a specific pattern, we'd be doing some type of hill climbing approach. And at best, that will usually result in a local maxima, but it's not really going to find the good designs in complex environments. 
So instead, we can learn from metaheuristic optimization, which uses a meta strategy to apply heuristics when searching for high quality designs that meet multiple objectives. And just like we can break a heuristic into an objective and a modifier, we can break metaheuristics into design selectors and modifier selectors. Design selector is going to choose a design based off of information from the objective function, and a modifier selector is going to modify those designs using information from the heuristic map. We can plug them into that kind of optimization cycle here. Both of these components become domain agnostic because they're using the heuristic map as the data structure that they are gaining information from rather than domain specific features. So for example, a design selector can use information from the objective function to determine which designs are best. And then we can select designs kind of on a spectrum from choosing a design randomly to choosing the best design and we can modulate that randomness using an entropy value. Alternatively, modifier selectors are going to use information from the heuristic weights to determine whether or not these will be successful. So for example, we can think about what's the expected best modifier based off of those heuristic weights, and then a random modifier, and again, control with entropy to choose between these. And using different design selectors and modifier selectors along these spectrums, we can reproduce existing metaheuristic um, techniques, such as simulated annealing, which we use for a lot of the knitting examples. Um, or ant colony optimization, which is what we used for creating tactile graphics. Uh, things like taboo search and Monte Carlo Markov chains and variable neighborhood search. We have all sorts of different methods that we can create by just mixing and matching different meta heuristics from this library. And doing this, we've been successful in creating a variety of kind of medical making optimizers using domain expertise from clinicians and people with disabilities to create these different assistive and medical devices. The kind of core insight here is that expert-driven optimization increases access to domain-specific design tools. Because by having those experts creating a design tool that can be reused over and over again, we're not just creating a single face shield or a single map, we're creating tools that other folks can use to create specific instances that meet their needs. And again, we come back to this idea of amplifying expertise from a specific set of designs that can be modified uh, by hand, or generating a specialized design from domain knowledge directly. But I think the place that we need to move forward is to connect these two, to move the domain expert out of the programming process entirely and use successful examples of designs that are already being shared to generate these kind of domain-specific heuristics. So in that sense, we have still the domain knowledge coming from the expert, and they're inputting that information into a generator to get a customized design. But that generator is created by domain-specific design corpuses. I think we have a real opportunity here that we did not have five years ago when I started this research, which is that these corpuses are getting bigger, they're getting better, they're getting more specific. We have things like Ravelry for machine knitting in the 3D uh, thingiverse, which I had, but we also have the NIH 3D print exchange with these refined, defined, reviewed designs already. And this means that we can start to leverage techniques that people have been using for a long time to create, generate text or images that have really started to improve, particularly in the last year around deep learning, um, and expand that into the fabrication space. But this opened up new sets of challenges. So for example, there are some techniques out there that are using deep learning techniques to modify existing 3D models to apply textures or different patterns for generative art. But when you apply this to make a 3D printed model, they tend to break specific components. So we have this articulated cat mechanism here that can kind of fold and walk around. And as soon as you modify any of the texture at the joints, it just kind of glues it into a flat 3D printed object, not very attractive. And last year, I've had the opportunity to uh, borrow some PhD students from other folks. I want to highlight Faraz Faruqi's work here, um, where he's taking information gathered from a corpus of 3Dverse models to learn what pieces of 3D models are functional or contributing to that mechanism functionality so that we can apply these methods and generate designs that are only using the generative or the AI component on the pieces that are aesthetic. And this opens up all sorts of interesting opportunities to learn from these designs without having more complex kind of 3D modeling tasks like we did with the assertions and integrators. Functionality aware generative fabrication um, can use resources like design repositories like the NIH or Thingiverse. It constrains and guides the generative techniques to the space where they are most useful while still building on the domain expertise of the original creator. And it can improve design reusability by giving us new ways of modifying designs with very minimal steps. So what are the kind of broader next steps for this line of research? Well, I think 
we can think about this whole component or this whole structure for these design tools that align with domain expertise and think about how these different components glued together are going to point us to interesting design tools. So we can think about how domain knowledge can be used to sort or filter through these de uh, design repositories so that we can label data sets more effectively. Um, we can think about ways to take domain knowledge to generate um, these or build these design generators without the assistance of programmers. Um, and we can think about ways to build these generators directly from these repositories themselves. And I think those next steps are really a wide open field for the space of dis digital design tools that are going to support a wider set of users than just the original engineers we've been supporting for so long. I want to thank my funders and the many institutions that have been involved in supporting this work during my thesis, as well as Corey College, who is now supporting my work. Um, and I'm happy to open it up for questions and discussion. So we have plenty of time for discussion. There's a mic. I have a question. I have a question about slide 116, if you could go back to that. Oh, goodness. OK. Very specific. Yes. So can you explain why, um, yeah, right here. So why do the automatic weights and domain expert weights look like they have about the same score? Um, that's a good question. It's probably because, I think this might be more of a experimental feature. Um, for all those domain experts that we used, we were also using the same um, online like samples that they had created um, instead of just pulling from a repository. Because at this point in the research, we still needed the models to be labeled in a very specific way that we didn't, we couldn't just pull things from like Thingiversity and IH 3D Print Exchange. Um, and so that's, it's probably more that like they use their domain expertise to generate those models. I'd see, a, I'd expect, we'd see a lot more variance if you were to like build a face shield generator and pull things down from the NH3 print exchange than if you were to take a specific clinician and have them set the heuristic weights. I see. Okay, thank you. Yep. I thought you had a question. <laughs> I do. Oh, yeah. I'm moving into the mic around. Oh, I see, I see. Um, okay, so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on uh, interpretability of the resulting designs. So there's uh, been a lot of discussion of how to take domain expertise knowledge and uh, pull it into the how of how design, uh, of designs work, but, uh, or sorry, like what the designs should do. But um, we haven't yet talked about sort of reporting back to, to the domain experts of sort of like, you know, why the design is how it is or like how it's, how it's operating and sort of like making that a two-week communication. Uh, curious to hear your thoughts on that, whether that's a, a goal that's um, uh, maybe worthwhile to the domain experts or are they mostly just thinking about the like, make it do what it wants to do? Yeah, so this is a little bit why we um, took meta-heuristic optimization or focused in on heuristics as the approach here. Um, from the domain experts' perspective, when we asked them to build heuristics, we didn't say things like better heuristics and heuristics because they would get kind of lost. Um, we would say things like, what are the steps that you take? Like we'd walk through this process of like, what are your goals? What are your steps that you take to meet those goals? And essentially we're asking them to describe how they go about design, um, right? This was particularly clear when we were working with the um, occupational therapists on how they do splinting. Um, the result of that is that when we showed them the samples we were creating with these optimizers, they innately understood why it made the decisions it did, because they had essentially told it what decisions to make. This is really different than if you're building on a like, you know, other types of machine learning techniques, or certainly something like deep learning, where it's like, we don't even know, as computer scientists, why it's doing what it's doing. We just know it does. Um, I don't know how we can solve some of the fabrication challenges of making, particularly these users who really need to trust what they are working on or what they have produced, fit into those models directly. Um, I think that is a huge challenge. I'm not sure what the right approach is going to be. Um, because with many of the clinicians I've worked with when we're creating these 3D printed objects, they really want to know the process. Um, now this gets into some interesting kind of complications, particularly when we were doing PPE design, that all of the work of like creating splints I had been doing or prosthetic devices, those are made by clinicians already. They're the designers of those objects. We were just providing tools to make it easier for them. The clinicians don't make PPE. They don't know why N95 masks work. They don't know why face shields work. They don't know how to build these things. That's a different set of experts who are essentially engineers who build those objects. And so they cared a lot less about the resulting product because they just 
trusted these things. If you said, oh, it's N95, they're like, yeah, that's kind of like if you told me, put on a piece of fabric and say it's N95, I'd just have to trust you. Um, and so it ends up being really different depending on who you're working on of like who is kind of the expert in the space and they're not always the same set of users as the final product. And so I think interpretability is really considering we need to be very thoughtful about the stakeholders and what does interpretability mean to each of them. So I wanted to hear a little bit about your thoughts on motivations uh, for these orthogonal experts. So um, Mako Hill and Andres Monroe Hernandez have this work showing that like functional artifacts get remixed and reused more often than creative artifacts. So I totally am with you that like, you know, sort of honing in on these functional reusable components makes sense. And yet if you walked up to me and said, uh, Michael, can you please encode, you know, your like, you know, heuristic weights that you use as an advisor so that it can aid other people? Like, it's sort of hard for me to imagine what that's going to be used for or how I contribute to the community in doing so. I'm, so I'm curious how you, in the cases that you did this, or if you imagine in the future, like, how do you go to these orthogonal experts and motivate them to encode these, you know, what can be somewhat abstract sets of heuristics and weights and so on in a way that they are gonna be able to point and be like, yeah, I helped that. Yeah. So I think, um, the groups that we were really had an easy time motivating were not trying to create general purpose design tools. Like let's take the cataract lens selection. It chooses from like 10 brands that happen to be in a box in a closet at the University of Washington. It does not, it is not a general purpose tool, but it is really helpful to the residents in that particular department for solving a problem that usually takes them an hour and they have to do a bunch because they do like 10 surgeries a week on this. Um, and so I think the approach of heuristic maps helps you solve a specific problem that people are doing over and over again. It doesn't solve these kind of ge general purpose design challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I still think we need to use these kind of more general purpose 3D modeling tools to kind of go through the iterative process. There's a materiality of working with the materials and kind of building these different designs that helps people eventually come up with this idea of a set of objectives that matter to them and a set of modifiers. But without that experience, they're not necessarily going to come up with those just off the top of their head. Yeah. Um, these design tools that these optimizers support are, I like to call them prescriptive design tools where someone puts in a prescription and it produces the result, like a, very much fits in that clinical model of like doctors are used to writing up a prescription and then the pharmacist gives you a pill. Yeah. Um, and they want those, they just kind of fill that gap for physical devices. And one follow up here. I wonder if you could comment on the sort of like semantic gap or the gap of the gulf of execution here where like I'm a domain expert just between my tacit knowledge of my area and the sort of proto language, so to speak, that you've generated for articulating these constraints and these weights and so on, how hard was it to explain to them this is what this does and why you got to write it this way? Like, is, was it hard for them to articulate it in that form or? Many of the early iterations, yes. Once we got down to like objectives and modifiers and we had a couple of different ways of framing those terms or different terms, so we might say goals and tweaking or parameters or something like that, depending on who we were working with. But coming down to like that component saying there's a relationship between those seemed to work across a bunch of groups. It worked in knitters, people who were from the blind low vision community understood it, different clinicians understood it. So that seemed to like kind of be where we converged on. Mm -hmm. um, many of the early iterations of working on this kind of approach we had, we were trying to express more complicated things like um, design processes are like, if this happens, what do you do next? And building out kind of a decision tree and that they got, we could not get a consistent result from different populations for, for making. So it, I think it was like, we had to keep it simple and that definitely limits the capabilities of the optimizer, right? These aren't high, like they're not going to generate anything. They're certainly not going to produce like a global optimum or anything like that. They're not even that efficient. Um, but for the problems we were solving, it didn't need to be fast, or at least not computationally fast, it needed to be faster than a person. Um, and it didn't need to result in a global optimum because the comparison is something that they were already making. It needed to produce a result that they would recognize as similar to what they would have done. Thanks. Um, so this is a question that maybe applies to a couple of the projects, um, but Thinking about the ones where you had like the domain experts, like the orthogonal experts, like 
articulate kind of their steps and heuristics for the final design. Were there ever cases where they were kind of unaware of their own design process or like not knowing to communicate certain like constraints just because they were so obvious or like apparent to them and everyone in their domain? So definitely the blind and low vision community comes to mind when we were making tactile maps. This was definitely a group mainly because most of the folks we were working with, they don't design tactile graphics, right? They are not the original designers. They don't have that knowledge. Um, and I think we had to restructure the conversation with them to be more about needs instead of goals. Um, needs seem to be the keyword to get them um, to understand it, as well as skills. Um, so often we would say, like, what are your tactile skills? What are tactile objects that are recognizable to you? Um, and that was able to help us build out that uh, set of objectives and modifiers. And so they didn't have that design intuition, but they did have that kind of internalized knowledge of what worked for them. Okay.